coming up. Sounds emitted by tomato fans. A six-year study reveals when distressed, plants make ultrasonic sounds researchers believe are cries for help. We use mostly toothbrushes, uh, drying the plant and cutting it. In both cases, they emit sounds. But what does it all mean? If plants could feel, then we might have to think about how we what we consume and how we consume it. We chat with Denmark's ambassador to Turkey about the Nordic country's climate-friendly technologies. When it's windy, and we have a lot of windy days in Denmark, we actually produce more than 100% of the electricity we need. And after years of extreme drought, more than a dozen powerful winter storms hit California, and the US state experiences its heaviest snowfall in decades. Even though we have this extraordinary snowpack, we know that uh, the droughts are getting deeper and more frequent. Um, and that means we have to use water efficiently no matter what our hydrologic conditions. This is Just Two Degrees, TRT World. Well, after three years of extreme drought in California, a wet and wintry start to the year has delivered so much snow the equivalent of around 9 million meters of water. Powerful atmospheric river storms in the U.S. state have not only filled reservoirs, but also overflowed watersheds. And talk about snow. Record snow has blanketed the Sierra's majestic peaks and mountainsides. There's also been widespread flooding, rock falls, and sinkholes even. But this doesn't mean there's water for everyone. Some areas like the Colorado River will continue seeing drought conditions affecting millions of residents in Southern California. Even though we have this extraordinary snowpack, um, we know that uh, the droughts are getting deeper and more frequent. Um, and that means we have to use water efficiently no matter what our hydrologic conditions. And authorities in California say statewide there's been 236% more snow than the norm and nearly 300% more in the southern Sierra region. Well, moving on, in March, Denmark launched project Green Sand, a scheme to bury large amounts of carbon dioxide beneath the seafloor. The process is called carbon capturing, which the Danish government hopes can help the country meet its climate targets. But scientists warn carbon capture isn't a silver bullet. Carbon capture refers to the management of carbon dioxide at places such as oil refineries and power plants. The process also involves removing CO2 from the atmosphere through direct air capture, or DAC, technologies. Once the gas is obtained, it's compressed into a liquid state and injected underground, usually at depths at one kilometer or more. There, it fuses with rock formations. It is an expensive process, and fossil fuel companies argue there's no economic incentive to do it. There is a growing debate, however, over whether selling carbon dioxide to fertilizer and plastic industries would serve as motive. But even that's received a share of criticism. Environmentalists say being able to reuse CO2 means energy companies continue operating as they have without having to change the way they do business. The United Nations warns carbon capturing cannot work alone to reduce emissions. Scientists argue achieving climate targets would require using carbon capture, also blue hydrogen green hydrogen, electrification, and wind and solar energy. In 2022, more than 240 million tons of CO2 were captured by 30 carbon capture and storage projects worldwide. That figure would need to rise to over 1.6 billion tons for the planet to be on path to net zero emissions by 2030. So Danny Annan, he's Denmark's ambassador to Turkey. He visited us on Just Two Degrees to discuss how his country became a climate leader and how it's sharing that knowledge. I think the main thing is that we actually started quite early. When the oil crisis hit Denmark in 1973, we were 90%, more than 90% dependent on imported oil. That was, of course, a, a big hit to our economy. So shortly afterwards, uh, the government decided that we need to do something about it. If we look at the situation today, actually more than 80% of our electricity is produced from renewable energy resources. Our ambition is that that should reach 100% in 2030. Talk about the sacrifices and challenges that you guys have faced, what the country's faced along the way and getting to the point that you're at right now. Of course, one of the main challenges with, um, with renewable energy resources, solar, 
wind is that it is dependent on the weather. Uh, so you cannot always have the guarantee. Uh, just to mention an example, uh, when it's windy, and we have a lot of windy days in Denmark, we actually produce more than 100% of the electricity we need. So a part of the solution is that when we have surplus production, we export our electricity to neighboring countries. When we have not enough electricity, then we import from other countries. So basically, we are doing energy trading with our neighbors. And that is a big part of, of the solution. Denmark has not let its uh, challenges stop it from achieving its goals when it comes to renewable energy. You've created the world's first energy islands, as they're called. What are they and what do they do exactly? The fact of the fact is that the Danish government is quite ambitious. Uh, we have uh, certain targets. 2030, we need to have reduced our CO2 emissions with 70%. Uh, the government we just have had installed in, in December actually made an even more ambitious target. We used to be zero emissions 2050, now it's 2045. Uh, so, so we need to do a lot. In 2021, we were at uh, 40%. So we need to really focus. And that's where the energy islands come into place. We will install in the North Sea an artificial island surrounded by 10 very big wind, uh, wind power farms generating a lot of electricity. In 2030, our ambition is that th that area is going to produce 10 gigawatt of electricity. That is sufficient for 10 million households. And you have to remember the Danish population is 5.8 million. So we will be generating a lot more electricity than we do actually need in Denmark. That's also why the government has entered into an agreement with neighboring countries about, again, energy trading. That's a part of it. Another part of it is the fact that electricity, yes, we can use it for normal uh, vehicles, but we cannot use it for trucks. The batteries are simply not big enough today. Uh, so there is a need to uh, develop and produce a lot more uh, green hydrogen than we are today. One of the issues you see around the world is pushback from the uh, public and the private sector. How has your country gotten people who live there, Danish people, as well as the private sector, on the side of the government uh, to come back global warming? Tax incentives is, is, a, is a good thing. Carbon tax is a more negative instrument, but also a very efficient instrument. But I think the most efficient instrument that we have actually used in Denmark is uh, uh, environmental education. People uh, will know that the, the best way to save the climate the best way also to save money is actually uh, by not using the energy. So if you are in, a, in, in your private house, you will turn down the heat or you will, when you leave a room, you will turn off uh, the light. This next story is about screams for help, some of which are coming from inside your own house. You won't hear them though, the cries we're talking about are inaudible to humans, although some animals can hear them. Sharon has a story. The sounds you're hearing may not sound alarming, but they are crying plants that have either been denied water or had their stems caught. A study by Tel Aviv University has found that plants do not suffer in silence. We arrived to this research from an open evolutionary question because plants have a lot to benefit, potentially, from emitting sounds and from responding to sounds. The plants are surrounded by many organisms that can respond to sounds, yet plants were considered entirely mute. And we came to test this question. So if plants were emitting sounds at the hearing range, we would have known that already. So we tested the sounds emitted by plants in the ultrasonic range. Thinking of carrying out these tests yourself, well, you'd need the right tools. In this study, we've shown that plants emit ultrasonic sound signals, signals that are above the human audible range. In order to record such signals, one needs special microphones, microphones that are sensitive to ultrasound. This is an example of such a manipulation we did on tomato sounds that we recorded.
And these are sounds that were recorded from grapevines and manipulated in, in the same manner. Different sounds mean different things. Relaxed plants emit less than one sound per hour. Those that are dehydrated or injured release dozens over the same period. Sounds that can be heard by various animals like mice, bats and insects. But plants don't have vocal cords or lungs. So how are they able to cry? The current theory is the noise centers on the xylem, a special tissue that serves as a channel for transporting water and nutrients from roots to stems and leaves. The discovery could be groundbreaking for the agriculture industry. Researchers say more precise irrigation can save up to 50% of water use and could be more significant now than ever as the climate crisis increases the frequency of droughts. While we wait for more studies, into screaming plants. Do check on yours at home. They could be crying out for help. Right now, Sharon Ogunleye, just two degrees. Super interesting, right? Well, I chatted with Kate Werner, senior campaign manager at PETA, to get the animal rights organization's take on this. This study has found that plants make noise, but likely from the formation and bursting of air bubbles in their vascular system. There's zero evidence to suggest that plants are sentient in any way, so they're not screaming in pain like you or I or other animals do. And they don't have a central nervous system or brains, so they can't feel pain and suffer like the animals who are mutilated or confined or slaughtered for a meal um, and live their lives on farms. But this might, this might open up research into that to figure out whether plants can feel at the moment, like I say, um, there's no evidence to suggest that they're feeling pain. And it's worth remembering that eating plants directly, um, like vegans do, rather than feeding them in massive quantities to animals on farms and then killing those animals for their flesh, requires far fewer plants and doesn't hurt any animals who indisputably do feel pain. So anyone who's worried about the welfare of plants and reducing suffering of sentient beings should go vegan. So yet, hypothetically speaking, if we were to learn that plants could feel, what does that mean for how we approach what we eat? Well, I mean, um, I guess hypothetically, like I say, if plants could feel, then we might, um, we, like I say, we might become fruitarians, we might have to think about how we what we consume and how we consume it. But what we do know right now, as I say, is that plants don't feel pain and suffer in the same way that we and other animals do. So right now, the, the number one way people can have an impact for the animals, but also for the planet, is um, to eat fewer plants by, by go, becoming vegan. Um, we know, for instance, that like 90% of the world's soya crop is fed to animals on farms. Um, the rainforests are being um, deforested to, to plant crops that are then fed to animals on farms. So it's completely inefficient and completely unsustainable. Um, and so, yeah, if you're genuinely concerned about plants, then the best way to reduce your impact on them and indeed the planet and the animals is to go vegan. Well, well schooling in many parts of the world involves sitting at a desk on a daily basis. Preparation for the future involves test scores and grading in math and sciences. But in Sweden, there's an added option where the youngest loon in the wild, Sarah, has more. In many schools, a visit to the forest is likely to look like a one day field trip. But at this preschool in Sweden, known as a rain or shine school, the forest is the classroom every day. No one talks about the outdoor. They, they see the indoor environment as they, this is the only place we are, the classroom, the, the room in the school, the laboratory, the gymnastic halls. So, I mean, it, we, I, I say it, we, we need to have a, a paradigm shift in the brain about thinking about learning. What is learning about? What is teaching about? The school promises young students a hands-on experience. These two and three-year-olds have been studying fire for the last six weeks. 
drawing it, using charcoal made from the fire itself, watching films about it, chopping wood to feed it, and using it to cook to feed themselves. All five senses are activated. And teachers say splitting pancakes is a better way to teach division than writing on a board. All part of the many lessons which show them what they can do, even at a young age. It's good for them to, to learn how to handle their own stuff. Uh, and it's also very, they're very proud that they can do that. And the children learn about more than just taking care of themselves. And we also work a lot of taking care of each other. Because that's the same thing. If you want to take care of something you like, you take care of your friends. And we believe that if you, if you take care of each other, it's, it's a much better place to be for all of us. This forest school started in 1985 and teaches children in more than 200 schools nationwide. The approach is so popular, especially for its health benefits, that more than 300 students are on a waiting list for this school alone. It's, uh, I mean, the cortisone is the stress hormone. If, if you go to green and blue environment, the stress level goes down and the concentration will be higher and it's better to concentrate. And while the children benefit from the natural surroundings, they learn about climate change and conservation so they can return the favor and give back to the environment too. Sarah Balter, Just Two Degrees. Well, a forest school for preschoolers introduces us to the importance of the environment and education. Here to talk to us about that today is Temilade Salami. She is a climate education consultant and joins us from Abuja in Nigeria. Hi there, Temilade. It's good seeing you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. Thank good you afternoon. so much for having me. Not a problem. You know, these days it, we learn about the climate crisis through the news, through the internet. But how amazing would it be if we can all be learning this from a school syllabus? I think it's very important that when we talk about climate education, um, we also talk about climate education in schools because it's very important that we begin to nurture the children, the kids from a very young age for them to take responsibility and to understand what's currently happening you know, on our planet. I remember um, you know, when I was really young, there were some things and activities that I engaged with while I was in school. And some of those things I still have some of those, those cultures with me right now because they were embedded in me while I was still very young. So it's very important that we have it in our schools because this is where we, we grow and this is where we spend majority of our time as children, um, you know, while we're still young. Climate, the climate crisis is such a huge topic from natural disasters to climate mitigation, climate financing. If you were in control of what a school uh, curricula looked like when it comes to the climate crisis, what would you put in there? Um, I will make sure it is contextualized, you know, um, context for every country, mm. every region and every nation is very different. And the second thing I will make sure I do is to bring it home. So if we're teaching climate change education in an African setting. I'll make sure the illustrations in the book are you know, made in black characters just to make sure that we have representation in all of the materials. Another thing I would look at is to quit the blame game. You know, um, there is a way we've been teaching climate change for a long while, um, you know, blaming people, especially young people, but in a way that actually spurs them into action and to take responsibility on their own side. The other thing I would do is to ensure that it's not just learning in a way that's too rigid. You should also include play, you know, extracurricular activities, um, workbook at the back, and also a, a session where they can always um, go back to and say, okay, I have done this. I've switched up the lights. Now I have one star. I have two stars. I have three stars. And these are some of the things we can put in some of the books and curriculum we're coming up with or we plan to come up with that can allow people to take responsibility, especially young children. There was a case highlighted by the Guardian newspaper um, of a Harvard law professor who is concurrently a board member at an American oil and gas company. Um, what's your response to something like that? I think, um, like I always say, it's two sides of a coin. You know, we can we can say yes. That's that can sound very hypocritical. Being 
somebody, you know, working in oil and gas sector. And then on the flip side, you're, you know, a lecturer in Harvard. And the other side would be, how do we change the system without being in the system? That's another question I ask. So if the oil and gas company is looking to actually start making renewables, they're still going to employ people who have the knowledge for the renewables. So I don't totally, you know, have the idea that everything has to be black and white and, you know, words and opposites. It could actually coexist in a way that there could be a transition going on and they need experts to come up. You know, this is just based on the question you yes. hypothetically asked. Details. And just, right, and just, to con the just for content, the law professor in question says she is using her influence in this company to direct the, uh, the oil and gas company to, to transition uh, to greener technologies. But of course, that's under a lot of criticism because the company in question is not doing so. But Temelade, really great having you in the program. Thank you so much for your time once more. Well, our jungles are changing so fast, environmentalists warn we won't have much left in 100 years. So what can we do? Protecting forests falls not just on governments, but individuals. Sharon has more. The perfect escape for residents of Rio de Janeiro. Oi, 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 you. Tijuca and Preda Branca urban forests sit in the heart of the Brazilian city. Experiencing nature up close is what many people seek each day. Much needed respite from their busy lives. When you are in the middle of the forest, you feel more human, you feel more belonging to this world. Because you are walking, you are listening to the sound of the water. Healthy forests mean healthy people. It's easy to see the connection. Healthy forests mean healthy people. It's easy to see the connection. Forests help maintain the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Like the Amazon rainforest, described as the lungs of the planet. Forests cover 31% of land and are home to 80% of all species. And that includes a vast array of plants with many found to have medicinal properties. Also, critically endangered animals live in forested areas. But these massive green spaces are under threat. Livestock and deforestation are expanding at an alarming rate, and seasonal fires are increasing in frequency. Every minute, the equivalent of 14 football fields disappear. Brazil's Amazon forest quite possibly is undergoing the most dramatic of changes. Since the turn of the century, forest areas have rapidly declined. We just left behind a government that supported deforestation and completely abandoned actions to control it. The truth is that unless the Amazon is protected from those who would deforest it and who abuse it, we cannot keep the Earth's temperature to 1.5 degrees without the Amazon being protected, being nurtured and respected. And the Amazon is not alone. Basins in the Congo and Southeast Asia lose millions of square kilometers of woodlands every year. La situation à RDC est un peu plus compliquée parce que c'est c'est un peu un peu un pays extrêmement dense. Ils perdent chaque année 500 000 hectares de forêt aujourd'hui, euh, liés essentiellement à l'utilisation des ressources naturelles par les populations euh, locales, et c'est une vraie préoccupation. Trouver des solutions pour permettre à ces populations de vivre dans ces territoires sans pour autant. Much of the damage in northern Asia has been due to wildfires. In 2015, Indonesia experienced the most disastrous fires that affected 26,000 square kilometers of forest. The government called the flames a crime against humanity of extraordinary proportions. In eastern Asia, agriculture and logging are the key drivers. And record heat waves have sparked forest fires in Europe and Australia. Scientists have been sounding the climate crisis alarm for a while now. They warn global rainforests could all but disappear in 100 years if the current rate of deforestation continues. And we are already halfway there. 50% of all rainforests have already been wiped out. And the world without forests 
would have devastating consequences. A historic deal was signed last year, one promising to halt biodiversity loss and protect and restore land and seas. And there are benchmark cuts for greenhouse gas emissions for the coming decades. But according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, global energy-related carbon emissions rose almost 1% in 2022, a record high. Proving benchmark cuts are so far only theoretical. Sharon Ogunleye, Just Two Degrees. And that's how we end this episode of Just Two Degrees. For more climate content, look for us on YouTube. Until next time, bye.